think we have a good amount of people here and more will be tricking, trickling in, but let's get started for now. This is the third webinar in the Spring 2020 uh, Modeling Collaboratory for Subduction Zone Science webinar series. And hopefully we'll continue this uh, next year and in future years. And today we have some excellent speakers who are involved with the M9 project. Um, we have Alex Grant, Aaron Wirth, and they will be moderated by Allison Duval, who is also a uh, member of the uh, MCS RCN Steering Committee. Um, just a, a couple of notes, logistical notes. You can find out more information about this webinar series, including watching past and future webinars that are recorded uh, on our website, sc4dmcs.org. And um, like I said, we have past webinars up there. This too will be up there soon after we finish recording it. And, uh, and one final thing is we have a, a webinar, the, the last webinar in our spring series is next week. Uh, that's with Greg Tucker and Phaedra Upton. So we hope you'll join us for that as well. There is a separate uh, registration you have to do on Zoom for that. So we hope we'll see you there as well while we're riding out this quarantine with nothing else to do. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Allison. All right, thanks Gabe. Well, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to this webinar. I'm Allison Duval. I'm on the faculty in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington. And with me today are Dr. Erin Wirth, uh, she's a research geophysicist at the U.S. Geological Survey and an affiliate assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at UW. And Alex Grant, who is a research civil engineer at the USGS Earthquake Science Center and also an affiliate pro assistant professor in the Department of Earth Space Sciences at UW. And so all of us are part of this uh, large research project called the M9 Project that Gabe just mentioned. So I thought I would start today um, before turning it over to Alex and Aaron by just briefly describing um, that project and then I'll, I'll turn it over to them. So Aaron, you want to screen share? Yeah. Yeah. Let's All right. Can you, can you see it okay? Yeah, got it. Okay, so the, the M9 project, which was uh, generously funded by the NSF, is a joint collaboration um, between scientists at the University of Washington, the USGS, um, and the main project goal was to reduce the catastrophic consequences of Cascadia megathrust earthquakes. Um, and we wanted to do this through advances in science, engineering, and planning. And you can see from this nice image uh, on the right here, which was um, made by a project member, Nasser Marafi, that uh, this is a very multidisciplinary project. Um, so, um, and what, what you can't see on this screen, um, it would fill the whole screen if we put in all of the different um, stakeholders that um, are working with us on this project. So this includes a really diverse team of experts that span the academic, public, and nonprofit sectors, um, and obviously a wide uh, swath of disciplines, um, as you can see here from um, all the different um, uh, subdisciplines that are represented on this graph. Um, so the project funding um, by NSF technically ended last year, but we continue to work together um, and collaborate on these topics. And you'll hear more about that collaboration um, today. So I'm going to turn it over to Aaron and Alex and let them share a little bit about their roles in the project specifically, um, also how they started uh, working together. And after that, um, they're going to walk through some of their key science outcomes um, with the work. And after that, we'll open it up to conversation and questions from you, the audience. All right, so I'll, I'll let Aaron uh, and Alex take over. Sure. So just to um, briefly mention where we fit in on this project. So if you look at this diagram, um, I think myself and Art Frankel are kind of this top bubble here, this M9 Cascadia subduction zone simulation. So we were doing large computer simulations of what various um, magnitude nine Cascadia earthquakes could look like. And then this trickled down to other parts of the project. Um, I don't know, Alex, if you wanna share where you were on this diagram. Um, sure, so I'm a piece of the landslide bit um, over to the right. Um, but as I'll talk about a bit in my slides, um, I've kind of wandered around the circle in a good way and tried to work with a bunch of different groups. But I came in as a graduate student to do landslides, working with Allison and others in the 
engineering department. Yeah, and then I guess I should mention when I started um, this project, I was a, a postdoc at the University of Washington, but then transitioned to my USGS position. And as Alex said, we've kind of um, touched on, although we'll be focusing on maybe this bubble and the landslide bubble, um, we have both walked around much of the circle and are happy to chat about that during the discussions about how these interactions worked with all these various groups. So is there anything else you wanted us to share, Allison, before we... No, I think, I think that's a great way to set the stage. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to sort of how it is that, that you guys have found success working across these different boundaries, the modeling and data observing, observables boundaries, but also the disciplinary boundaries. But um, I think now would be great for you guys to share some of what you consider to be some of the exciting key science outcomes um, from the work. Yeah. Great. Um, so I'll get started and I, I have about 10 minutes or so and I'm going to talk both about um, kind of our general uh, approach to addressing some of these questions and then I'll give you a little sampling of results but um, not a whole lot that I can show you in a, in a short time frame. Um, so I'd like to start with this figure, which I think many of you have probably seen before just because it puts us in the context of earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so just quickly, we expect that there's um, three types of earthquakes that happen here. Um, so there's shallow earthquakes in the crust that happen in response to um, crustal deformation. We also have deep earthquakes in the subducting Juan de Fuga slab. Um, these are our most common type of earthquakes. We had one in t as recently as 2001. And then we also know that the Cascadia subduction zone is capable of having these large magnitude 9 earthquakes on the megathrust fault offshore. Um, we know from a range of geologic uh, evidence that the last earthquake occurred in the year 1700, as well as we know that from a tsunami that reached Japan. Um, and so this is the this magnitude 9 or this large megathrust earthquake is the type of earthquake that the M9 project was focused on studying. So M9 stands for magnitude 9. Um, and kind of the overarching question that um, I was trying to address with Art Frankel as seismologist on the project was what is the range of possible ground shaking that the Pacific Northwest could experience from a magnitude 9 Cascadia earthquake? Um, so to attack this question, um, we ran a number of 3D uh, supercomputer simulations of various magnitude 9 earthquake scenarios that could happen in the Pacific Northwest. Um, at a very basic level. Uh, these were kinematic simulations, so we need to prescribe three things. So one is um, what the earthquake source looks like. We also need to prescribe the 3D structural model that wave energy is going to be propagating through. Um, and then the locations at the surface that we want to record synthetic ground shaking for. So we use a finite difference method for all of this. Um, the easiest thing, as you can imagine, I'm kind of going to work my way backwards here, is just prescribing where the receivers are. So we save ground motions everywhere in the Pacific Northwest on a one kilometer grid. So that makes for about 600,000 um, sites for each simulation that we have synthetic ground shaking records for. So kind of working my way backwards, um, for the, the 3D structural model, we use a um, seismic velocity model that was developed by Bill Stevenson at the USGS. Uh, this is based on a number of studies that have been done Pacific Northwest throughout the past few decades, um, reflection and refraction experiments, tomography, uh, information about where the plate interface is, um, as well as constraints on sedimentary basins from more local experiments. And then um, we've, over time, validated this 3D model against earthquakes that have happened in the Pacific Northwest. So we've modeled the 2001 Nisqually earthquake as well as numerous other um, small local events. So we have a pretty good idea as to where the model is doing a good job. Um, and then, as I, as I mentioned, these are kinematic models, so we need to describe um, the earthquake source. And so in our models, um, slip on the fault consists of two different things. So one is this background slip distribution. So this is kind of a slow buildup of slip with long rise time. And then superimposed on that are these um, strong motion generating or high stress drop sub events. And so you can imagine that um, slip on the fault in our model is a combination of these two things. And these, um, strong motion generating sub-events. So these are the places that generate the strongest ground shaking. 
as well as the highest frequency energy. And the reason we have them there, um, they're located in the deeper portion of the rupture and in these discrete patches. And we do that because um, we saw similar features in the 2010 Mali, Chile and 2011 Tohoku earthquakes. So we we're trying to take features that we saw in those global earthquakes and apply them here to Cascadia. Um, so then in these uh, 3D simulations, or sorry, in these simulations as a whole, we kind of um, used a hybrid approach in order to obtain broadband seismograms. So we take those 3D simulations that I just men mentioned using those, um, that finite difference approach, and we run that up to um, a frequency of one hertz. So we're limited both by um, computer power as well as our knowledge of the, the 3D velocity structure and the earthquake source physics that it's harder to, it's hard to push to higher frequencies, although groups are starting to do that. Um, so for the higher frequencies, we use a stochastic approach. Um, and then we also use site amplification from a 1D um, VS profile, generic VS profile that we apply to um, all of our grid points at the surface. And then you can combine these 3D simulations, so which cover the, the low frequency, less than one hertz, hertz range, um, with the stochastic synthetics that account for the frequencies above one hertz to get your broadband synthetic. And this is kind of a nice diagram that shows what this might look like. So again, this um, top seismogram would maybe be your deterministic your three, the result from your 3D simulation, you can add higher frequencies in there using a stochastic approach and combine them with a matched filter at one hertz to get what looks like this broadband synthetic. Okay, so I know I kind of flew through that, so feel free to ask me questions later if you'd like. Um, but all in all, so when we ran these simulations, we, um, we ran a total of 50, or we actually ran more, but a total of 50 that are publicly available. Um, now, and most of those simulations came from this logic tree. So the types of things that we varied from simulation to simulation were um, the rupture depths of so the down dip limit of rupture. Um, in our case, that's how close the rupture is going to get to cities on land, such as Seattle, Portland, Vancouver. Um, we also varied the hypocenter location, so where the earthquake starts. Does it start um, in the north, in the central portion, in the south, up dip, down dip? We also varied the slip distribution um, and where those strong motion generating sub events were along strike. But they were always in the down dip region, um, but we allowed their along strike location to vary. Okay, so this is an example of one of the simulations from our set of M9 Cascadia synthetics. Here you can see um, in this animation, seismic waves radiating outward from the hypocenter, and then just showing four locations what your synthetic ground shaking would be. Um, two things that are worth pointing out from this. Um, one is very obvious. You see there's very strong shaking here at Crescent City. So sites along the coast that are much closer to the megathrust fault offshore are, and closer also to those strong motion generating patches are going to exhibit much stronger ground shaking. Um, the other thing that I want to point out, and I can play this one more time. Um, and so you'll see this coming here in a second. So Seattle um, and La Grande, La Grande is apparently just a post office. <laughs> There's not much there. Um, but the reason we put it here is because it's the same distance away from the mega thrust fault offshore as um, Seattle. Yet you'll see in the synthetic uh, ground shaking recordings that um, Seattle actually is experiencing much stronger ground shaking than the ground, which is not necessarily what you'd expect if you're just thinking about how far they are away from the fault. And so this is because um, Seattle's in a deep sedimentary basin that's going to amplify ground shaking and the ground is outside of that basin. So in the, in the time that I have available, I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, what we saw in terms of this basin amplification effect um, in our 3D ground motion simulations. So this is a, a geologic map of Washington, and I don't expect you to see all the different colors and geologic names on here. Um, but the thing I want to point out is that if you kind of look in this Puget Lowland region um, around where Seattle is, that all this yellow stuff is uh, sedimentary deposits. And so those are going to, they're not necessarily deep basins, but this is still um, kind of soft material that's going to be amplifying ground shaking to some extent 
And then if we zoom in on this area here in the red box and we look at gravity anomalies, um, this is a map of gravity on the right. And you can see these prominent gravity lows, these blues showing up where we have deep sedimentary basins in the Puget Sound area. So I hope, can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the Seattle basin here, um, right beneath Seattle. And then just to our north, we have the Everett basin. To the south, we have the Tacoma basin. So these deep basins are uh, pretty pervasive throughout the Puget Sound area. So what is the impact of these basins and ground shaking? And so these basins are in our 3D velocity model. Um, so we should be able to quantify um, what the, the effect on ground shaking is from our 3D simulations. Um, so this is the one of the results from a single M9 earthquake scenario. And here I'm showing, uh, this is three second spectral acceleration. So you can think of this as shaking intensity, particularly at the period that's gonna impact shaking of tall buildings. And then everywhere you see um, a darker color is stronger shaking. So you can really see um, the Seattle and Tacoma sedimentary basins popping up as um, areas that experience much stronger ground shaking than the areas around them. And even within that, you, or just outside that, you see the Puget Lowland, the entire Puget Lowland area. So that kind of sedimentary region that I pointed out on the geologic map is amplifying more than areas um, say to the west in the Olympic Peninsula or to the east. So we can actually um, quantify that if we'd like. Um, so here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, take the ratio of the spectral accelerations for sites that are within the basin. So within this dark black line, this is downtown Seattle, right around where my cursor is. So kind of smack in the middle of that dark black line. Um, and then we'll take the ratio relative to sites that are alongside the or that are along this dotted line. So that's essentially the edge of the Puget Lowland. So then we can, doing that, we can create this basin amplification factor, which is again, a ratio of um, spectral acceleration or shaking intensity for sites inside the basin relative to outside the basin. And then this is a function of period. And so you can see that um, the Seattle basin for periods above one second is amplifying ground shaking. Um, relative to sites outside the basin and about at, at three seconds period, so the period that would impact a uh, say 30 story building, amplification factors are about a factor of five. So five times stronger shaking in the Seattle basin compared to outside. Um, so what is the actual impact on buildings? And so this I'm actually, this is a bit of an aside, but a slide that I'm taking from one of our colleagues, Nasser Marafi. So he was a structural engineer working on the um, M9 project. And so he actually took these synthetic ground shaking time series um, that I developed and ran them through models of tall buildings um, in Seattle or hypothetical tall buildings in Seattle. And so I'll play here um, these, let's see if this will go on its own. Yeah, okay, so here you're gonna see, um, this, is, this is exaggerated. But um, on the right, we have a tall building that is being subjected to a ground motion from inside the basin, and, sorry, on the left. And on the right, um, a building that is outside the basin. Okay, and so everywhere you see these dark colors are areas where steel reinforcing enforcing has been yielding. And then everywhere you see these um, kind of large circles are areas where you see likely slab wall or slab column wall failure. So I can play that one more time. Um, but obviously a very clear difference in the impact of structures depending on whether or not you're inside versus outside the basin. Okay, um, so I, I am going to start to wrap things up a little bit here and hopefully set Alex up to talk more about some of the things we've been collaborating on. Um, so both because of the time and also for some other reasons. I only showed you the uh, three second spectral acceleration, so kind of long period energy. And so you might be wondering, what about higher frequency energy? What about um, PGA? What about shorter structures? Um, what about ground failure? And one of the reasons why I didn't mention that is because it, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> and so if we go back to that, that um, schematic I showed of how we combine the low frequency deterministic synthetics with the um, stochastic synthetics. The stochastic th synthetics are dominating at periods above one hertz. 
And so you, if you recall, I kind of briefly mentioned that in that portion, we use site amplifications from a 1D um, shear velocity profile in the shallow soil layers. And we applied this generic shallow soil profile everywhere, uh, the same one everywhere in the Pacific Northwest. And if you kind of think back to that geologic map that I showed, that's probably not a good assumption that everywhere in the Pacific Northwest has these same shallow soil characteristics. And that's where um, working with someone like Alex, who's a geotechnical engineer, has been really helpful to take this kind of the next step towards understanding how ground motions are gonna be impacted by these shallow soil layers. So with that, I think I'll pass it on to Alex to talk about some of the new stuff we've been working on. Great, thanks Erin. And you tried to set me up and then I rearranged my slides. So everyone's going okay. to hang on for that for a minute. Um, hold on. And then I'll get to site response at the end. Uh, am I sharing? You are. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I want to start with a different take on that circle. Because um, what I want to show over the next couple, couple of minutes is just a quick view of some of these messier, but maybe more valuable interactions that happen during M9. Um, and so we have, there's been, really great collaboration between Aaron, Art, and the structural engineers, showing some of those basin response and da building damage. Um, there was a strong tsunami team that worked um, with community engagement and our planning group. Um, but what I'll try and touch on today are some of these other interactions that I was lucky enough to be involved in, both within the landslide group, um, combining engineering and geomorphology, as well as looking at um, kind of broader geohazards, working with Aaron, as well as uh, where I'll start which is in Aberdeen, Washington. Um, and this is it's very far outside of my normal background, but it's looking at how do we communicate this, these probabilistic hazards developed by the M9 team to a population or to kind of technical users, planners, developers, emergency managers, um, which was explicitly part of the M9 project. Um, and I was fortunate enough to work with Dan Abramson, Peter Dunn, and Bostrom and many others who pulled together these information on both what's possible in terms of structural damage, what's possible in terms of landsliding or liquefaction, uh, what do we expect for tsunami inundation, and then bringing that to an actual impacted community and trying to test um, what pieces of that information are best conveyed and how do we convey those information. Um, and so as kind of a two second background on Aberdeen, this is a very low lying flat a uh, town in coastal Washington that's a timber boom town. Um, there's still um, many thousands of people who live there, but it's uh, very close to sea level and hemmed in by these very steep and landslide prone slopes. Um, so they're quite isolated out there by the coast. Um, and we expect very strong shaking, uh, coast seismic subsidence, tsunami inundation, liquefaction, landsliding. Basically everything that could happen during an earthquake could, is possible in Aberdeen and may be quite severe. Um, and so what we're interested in for this particular kind of aspect of M9 was um, the need to provide emergency managers and planning departments with the best possible information that honestly reflected the science of M9. Um, and can we do that with probabilistic versus deterministic information? And what is the language that kind of those probabilistic information are wrapped around in? As well as how do you frame that discussion? Um, and what I mean by that is as you convey these information, do you start the discussion in terms of the assets of the community? Um, what are sources of resilience versus discussing the vulnerabilities and the potential harm that could happen during this uh, earthquake and its kind of co-seismic hazards? Um, and so that's one axis of this kind of thought experiment. The second is, is it better or more informative to show deterministic single scenario information, um, like a classic tsunami inundation map or a single hard lined edge, versus multi scenario probabilistic information, either um, in conditional probabilities or as a full return period or some expression of the kind of honest probability to those emergency managers. Um, and so, as part of the Aberdeen part of this work that Dan and Ann were leading, we went and talked with the uh, utilities and emergency management of the county and city, um, as well as various other stakeholders, and broke them into these different groups to see, is there a subpopulation or is there a combination of these factors that is most informative? Um, and here's an example. Um, this was all conducted as kind of an 
as part of an interactive mapping exercise. Um, and so they were sat in front of this interactive GIS where they could both verbally give notes as well as put actual points on a map. And so here people are identifying where the levees are, where hospitals are, various points of either vulnerability or resilience in that community um, here under the prompt of kind of what are the vulnerabilities that Aberdeen faces given this probabilistic estimate of tsunami inundation. Um, and overall what we see um, is kind of what you would expect that the deterministic um, map is seen as it is, that kind of everything is uniformly inundated, uniformly destroyed, whereas these probabilistic maps um, led to much more discussion about this is the port of Aberdeen, which is built on an engineered fill above the town. Um, that was seen as a much stronger source of resilience in these scenarios where it was shown to have lower likelihood of inundation. And likewise, the conversations that start with asset development um, are much more positive and the community is more willing to think longer term about how they could recover versus discussions around vulnerability quickly become just, oh, this is a doomsday scenario and there's very little hope. And this work continues in several different forms. Here's just an example um, that I'm helping to co-lead with uh, others at the USGS, where we're continuing to work with the state and county emergency ma management groups to look at what is the intersection between the tsunami evacuation routes uh, drawn here in red and the active and potential landslides across this community. Because um, we're quite concerned that you have several tsunami evacuation routes that go through these areas that are highly prone to landsliding and may not be viable in the critical hour after an earthquake. Um, changing gears, uh, another project under the M9 umbrella that Sean and Allison were heavily involved in as kind of a landslide geomorphologist was to look at what is the signature in the landscape of 1700 and what can we learn about the past landslides that have occurred, um, both locally and are there lessons to be learned globally um, from other subductions on earthquakes. And a lot of their effort was spent in the Oregon Coast Range and specifically in the Taiyi Formation where you have this massive expanse of a single geologic formation where we can limit as many variables as we can and try and tease out, is there a signature of co-seismic landsliding around 1700 and what do those landslides look like? And then ultimately, can we match that to forward models um, for future hazard? Um, and this all relies on a clever trick that Sean and Allison developed looking at a, if you have a small population of known or estimate, estimated ages for landslides um, from LIDAR DEMs, you can develop um, measures of the roughness or character of that landscape and make a regression to landslide age. Um, so from a few sets of data from radiocarbon or dendrochronology, you can estimate ages on thousands to nearly 10,000 landslides shown on the right over huge stretches of area. Um, and the punchline being that at least in the Taiyi of the Oregon Coast Range, there's not a strong 1700 co-seismic signal. Um, so Sean LaHoussin, who's now at the USGS, mapped uh, thousands and thousands of slides, has estimated ages for all of them. And then if we look approximately 300 plus years ago, there's not a huge pulse, uh, which is a frustrating result to find nothing, but at least is consistent with the global history where at least in recent great subductions on earthquakes, very few landslides are triggered, as well as the kind of overwhelming null data that exists in the Pacific Northwest where ground failure is just not necessarily observed associated with 1700, um, which has a couple potential implications and we're trying to chase down in a few different ways. Um, one is, does this tell us something about the way Cascadia ruptures? Is it potentially an earth a subduction zone that has slower tsunamogenic earthquakes as opposed to um, those that have lots of high frequency energy that would be associated with landsliding? As well as what I'm trying to illustrate here is on the left is the observed landslide density around 1700. Um, in the middle are what we would expect for a magnitude nine earthquake triggering landslides. Um, and they are almost exactly opposite. Um, these, these hotspots do not line up. And so can we leverage that to try and learn something about the landscape itself? And so work that Sean and I are continuing at the survey is to look at places where um, these uh, known and expected 
distributions don't line up? And um, what are the characteristics of the rock itself? And can we learn something about heterogeneity through this uh, kind of mixed data set that's rich in landslides but uh, lacking in co-seismic landslides? And then finally, what Erin was talking about is um, her and Art have spent a huge amount of effort making these great 3D synthetic seismograms that have a more of an emphasis on the low frequency. Our knowledge is greater for these, uh, the basin structure and up to one hertz, but the high frequency stuff is just messier and we couldn't, we don't have enough geologic knowledge to know that at the scale of the Pacific Northwest. And kind of critically for my work, the landslide and liquefaction hazards respond to um, fundamentally a broad band of frequencies, but most of the models are kind of limited to peak ground accelerations or peak ground velocities, which depend on those higher frequencies. Uh, and the disconnect here um, is that we have two very different views of the world's surface. Um, so in our 3D synthetic model, um, velocities are quite high. Most of these are 900 to 1,000 meters per second at the top um, and slower in the basin versus uh, what is our best estimate from various state compilations of local data that are much slower, um, typically on the order of three to 500 meters per second. Um, and so this disconnect can cause quite significant changes. Um, if we think of just simple site response um, going from an input of 600 meters per second at the top of the velocity, the synthetics as they are, and going to a softer site within Seattle, you have a large frequency content shift um, and change in amplitude. The same is true even for smaller changes in velocity. Um, but this has pretty significant implications in terms of if you're a three-story building or a 30-story building in Seattle, these are very different earthquakes um, given the site conditions, even for the same input. And so we care quite a bit about site response, um, but we weren't doing as well as we could have initially. Um, so we're fortunate in our timing to take advantage of NGA subduction um, and a lot of work that was done down at UCLA um, what, that compiled over 900 velocity profiles across the Pacific Northwest and allow us to explore questions like, is this a, are we in the Pacific Northwest close to the generic velocity model for the West Coast, which is kind of way out here, or are we even similar to California, um, which is well described by a recent uh, Shina Samaki paper out of Caltech. Um, and the short answer is no. The Pacific Northwest is quite different from California in terms of the velocity structure of the near surface. Um, this is slightly messy, but just to show these are residuals between the Northwest and California, and there's a systematic bias in the California profiles. It's just a different geologic context. Um, and so to resolve that, what Aaron and I have done over the last several months is recompute this uh, shallow velocity structure model for local data where we have kind of unbiased and just much better prediction using local data. And that's as expected. Um, and what we can then do is combine the original M9 simulations that Aaron and Art developed with local information on the near surface uh, velocities taken here as uh, VS30 and millions of simulations of site response that combine um, all possible combinations of these two to develop surface ground motions um, from the M9 synthetics. Um, and so here's just a snapshot of that showing uh, much more detail uh, where you have amplification along these alluvial river valleys where ground motion should be higher. Um, and this is just peak ground acceleration, so you don't see the basin structure as strongly. Um, but these are kind of trying to take account for that very shallow top 100 meters of soft sediment. And then finally is um, the part that I kind of finally get to do is with the initial M9 synthetics, we developed estimates of what is the likelihood of liquefaction or likelihood of landsliding in a couple of test cases here in Seattle and Portland, Oregon. Um, but now with these surface adjusted motions, we can revisit these to come up with better models for hazard and risk from these co seismic hazards, as well as hand off to federal and state partners like Cascadia Rising um, to give them kind of our best available es um, estimates of shaking hazards. Um, for their training exercises. That's all I have, so I'll stop sharing. Thanks very much. Um, you guys did a really good job of um, trying to distill many years worth of work into a very short amount of time. Um, so what I think 
uh, we'll do now is we'll open it up to questions and conversation. So um, I'm seeing that there are already some questions uh, specific to the science results that you guys just mentioned. So maybe we'll um, tackle those first and then if there's time, um, I thought that we could maybe talk a little bit about um, the collaboration aspects of the project um, and how you overcame some challenges there. So uh, looks like um, there was a question about um, for, I think, Aaron. So the question is, is it possible if 4D simulations of the past earthquakes could give ideas about the next earthquakes? Yeah. Um... I guess, yeah, so we've, we, to an extent, we've maybe tried to do this a little bit. Um, there's not a whole lot of quantitative information about past earthquakes, particularly I'm thinking about in Cascadia. Um, one of the, the better records that we have is um, the record of coastal subsidence from previous Cascadia earthquakes. And for that, we have tried um, comparing our M9 simulation results and what they would predict in terms of coastal subsidence to the geologic observations of coastal subsidence for past Cascadia earthquakes. Um, and there maybe are some things that you can, you can learn about previous Cascadia earthquakes from that. One is about um, the down dip rupture extent and how far inland we expect the rupture to occur. And the other is about the role of those strong motion generating areas um, and how they might contribute to a long strike variability and the signature that you see along the coast, um, again, in the geologic evidence. So there's uh, certainly the potential to learn something about previous earthquakes um, from this work, if that's kind of addressing your question. But again, there's not, there's not a whole lot of quantitative information that is available to be used. Okay, um, there was another question, but it looks like it was answered. Uh, and then I see a different question in the Q&A, which is for Alex. And the questions are, how are you estimating liquefaction from PGA slash ground shaking? Is it by proxy to map geology or are you using borehole data? And what program are you using for liquefaction potential or susceptibility? Uh, sure, so at least in the case of Portland, we're using borehole data directly. Um, and using Boulanger and Idris triggering for, uh, relationships. But it's all done in Python, so there's not necessarily a program. Um, we've just kind of coded up existing equations for that. But it's based on peak ground accelerations and borehole data that are then geospatially interpolated. Um, there may be kind of more simplified methods we have to adopt when we go at trying to estimate liquefaction for the state of Oregon or the whole region. Um, then you just don't have the borehole data coverage. Great. Um, another question for you, Alex. So shaking in 1700 probably does account for hundreds of sand dikes observed along the Columbia River. What is the outlook for using these observations? Um, we've talked with, so this is kind of a bigger question that touches on the Cascadia Recurrence Project that USGS is trying to tackle. Um, of can we combine not just the subsidence but also the absence of landslides and the presence of some of these sand dikes along the Columbia in a kind of holistic inversion of what do we know about 1700. Um, I don't think we've answered how we're actually going to do it um, but we are trying to pull all of those observations of sand dikes into kind of a single map and I think Maureen might even be on the line now so she can talk but people are trying to combine all these data into a single view of what do we know about 1700. Mm -hmm. But you could potentially try and invert for what's the minimum shaking required to create these sand dikes. Mm -hmm. That's a set of information. Um, okay, what other questions do you have from the science uh, from, from, the, from the science perspective or even just from the collaboration or um, sort of working across models and data perspective. If I can butt in, there's someone who has his hand raised, Frank Gonzalez, oh. which I think I could allow him to talk. Oh, cool. So yeah. let me see if that works. This is an experiment. It's in the Q&A. Yeah, uh, this is uh, just in the chat. Frank, can you speak? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Uh, I was just typing out a question. I'm not that used to the system here, but I was struck by Alex's, uh, by the landslides uh, data. Uh, 
uh, going back uh, thousands of years. And the, the, the mention that he made of nothing about the 1700 um, earthquake popping out. Um, so in, in warning systems for both, both tsunamis and earthquakes, this whole issue of whether a silent earthquake can occur on the CSZ or not, it's really up in the air. And I'm just wondering, Alex, if you, if you could just say a few words, is this data, uh, these landslide data, are they being um, actively analyzed um, uh, from the point of view of saying something about the possibility that silent earthquakes might occur on the CSC, tsunami earthquakes, if you will? I guess a couple things on that. The first, the credit for that inventory really needs to go to Sean LaHousen and Alison Duvall. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I was, yeah. I was, it's, I'm presenting on their behalf. Data. Yeah. Um, and it is great. Um, in terms of necessarily looking specifically to a silent earthquake, um, maybe not that framing, but Sean has written a paper and it's kind of working its way through looking at in under for the particular types of landslides he was looking at, which are quite large and not necessarily the totality of what could happen, um, what types of triggering would you see or not see in the existing landslide in the landscape? Um, and it does kind of hint towards there aren't huge numbers of landslides. What that tells us about the rupture is then one step removed from that, um, but it might tell us a little bit. You don't have these super uh, landslide exciting earthquakes happening, at least not in 1700. And I don't know if Allison has a better or clearer way of saying that. Yeah, well, no, I just think um, one thing to add, and you, you just mentioned it, but just to make very clear that, you know, the kinds of landslides that we were analyzing were larger and deeper seated, the kinds that you would see preserved in um, a LIDAR record. So if you had really um, shallow uh, landslides, which we know are very common uh, during co-seismic events, um, those would not necessarily show up in our data set. So that's just something to keep in mind also. Well, um, I'm just wondering, Allison, thanks, thanks to both of you. Um, uh, this, this may not make a lot of sense, um, but you know, there are the turbidite data um, and it's very controversial with regards to relating uh, earthquake intensity to, you know, the amount of turbidites and all of that. But um, you do have um, ages that might be correlated with, um, with the suggestions by the turbidite data that have to do with earthquake intensity. Is anybody, is any, does that make any sense? And is anybody looking at that? Um, I, I think I follow what you're saying, but um, I don't think we have quite the resolution in our data set to necessarily track to all of those individual earthquakes. Though I will say that um, Sean did consider the timing from the turbidite record when he was analyzing his large landslide data set and still doesn't necessarily see um, how those different events show up. They, they don't necessarily show up. In so, I mean, he looked at the timing for the 1700, but he did look at the timing for other... Yeah, we went back to several earthquakes. He did, several earthquakes. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Frank. Sure. Looks like um, in the Q&A, um, we've got several questions for Aaron. So, Aaron, I don't know if you can see those. Um, oh. The first question is, can you address something about directivity based on where the event starts and its relevance to Seattle Basin response? Yeah, so that's something that I kind of left out in the interest of time. But um, one of the things that we saw from these simulations, um, because we ran a variety of different hypocenter locations, so where the earthquake starts, and from that, we were able to see that, um, as expected, but directivity makes a huge difference in the amount of ground shaking that you might experience at a particular location. And in addition, um, it seems like directivity is coupling with basin amplification in, in the Seattle basin anyway. So if you have stronger ground shaking due to rupture directivity in the Seattle area, you're also going to have stronger basin amplification. So the, the amount that basin amplification factor grows when you have more rupture directivity. And that's something we're still trying to understand exactly why that's happening. Um, but certainly an, an interesting um, feature that I think we 
wouldn't have even really known to explore without having done the 3D simulations. Um, maybe you already sort of touched on this next question there, but um, it says, Aaron, I seem to remember from your paper that you found a difference between the basin amplification factors based on whether the rupture began deeper near the coast and moved generally west or began farther offshore and moved towards land. Is that accurate? And do you have any sense of the likelihood of those two situations? Yeah, so this is this is similar to the, the previous question in that the I think when they're referencing deeper, they mean just that if it's further down dip um, and ruptures away from you, it's also just going to ha happen to be deeper um, based on where the plate is. Um, in terms of, do you have a likelihood for the, these situations? Um, that's a hard one. Uh, <laughs> that's a question. There, there's maybe um, some evidence that ruptures are maybe more likely to start in the down dip portion of the rupture where you have um, more stress heterogeneity and um, there and some earth some large earthquakes we've seen that they have started down dip and ruptured kind of more in the up dip direction. So, but it's certainly nothing robust enough that I would say um, we can bank on that happening for Cascadia. Okay, so a few more for you, Aaron. So, does your earthquake source model consider variation in extent of updip rupture, for example, extending to the deformation front versus only to a splay thrust on the upper slope. If no. so, <laughs> the next one is going to be what's yeah. the effect on ground shaking. Yeah. Yeah, no, so the answer is no. So this is I, that we we did look at the impact of varying the down dip rupture limit. We didn't look at the impact of varying the up dip rupture limit. And the reason why is because um, the up dip rupture limit really doesn't, doesn't make a difference for ground shaking. And that's kind of what we were most focused on. But it's, of course, going to make a huge difference for tsunami generation. And so that's actually one of the areas of maybe the M9 project. We could have done a better job linking the tsunami generation to the actual ground shaking part. Um, by kind of working together on those that up dip aspect. Um, but for this particular project, no, we just varied the down dip rupture limit. Okay, so the next question is about early warning. So um, uh, somebody noted that the M9 project, there is an early warning component. Is it easy to do the early warning? Isn't it complicated? How much time do you have from the beginning of the earthquake to get the warning? Yeah, so I mostly am just going to, I think, answer the last part of that question. So I, I don't work on earthquake early warning. I mean, we have a, a great team, the USGS and academic community that is working on developing earthquake early warning and, it, and actually rolling it out. Um, so it's pretty much ready for prime time. But I'll, I, I'll address the question about how much warning time can you get. So that's something that people are really curious about, particularly for an M9 Cascadia earthquake, because you can imagine if an earth, if a rupture starts um, somewhere to the south, it could um, be detected very quickly, and then you would maybe be able to have a lot of warning time in cities that are located to the north, um, such as Seattle. Um, and it, so the answer is it really depends, again, on that hypocenter, so where the earthquake starts. If the earthquake starts, um, kind of right offshore Seattle, then you'll essentially have no warning time. Um, and I'm thinking of Seattle just because that's where I live. But if the the earthquake starts offshore in that Northern California, um, there is maybe the possibility of uh, maybe two minutes or so of warning. It's really hard to say because it also depends on um, how long certain things take in, how long it takes for an earthquake to grow to an M9. Like if um, an early warning system detected an earthquake offshore, would it even, how long would it take before it said, oh, this isn't an M7, it isn't an M8, it's an, it's an M9, and therefore I should alert all this entire region. And then there's the telemetry issue of how long it actually takes to get messages to people. So it's really hard, it's really hard to say, um, but there are certain extreme scenarios where you maybe could get minutes of warning. Okay, this next one I think might be for Alex. So um, what was the, thic the thickness of the softer geotechnical layer in the site response analysis used to supplement the M9 simulations? Or I guess either of you can answer this. And then I understand a majority of the NGA sub V's data in Washington and Oregon are shallower than 30 meters. Did you extrapolate to larger depths? 
Yeah. Um, and I should also say, I think I got rid of it, but Sean Lehusen wanted to comment, and I don't know if I can turn on his mic um, from earlier. Um, but to answer um, Allison's question, um, we're, right now we're using a 100 meter thick geotechnical layer um, that is extrapolated for most of the data. There are quite deep velocity data that are included in that set. So it's a mixture of kind of everything that we had available. Um, but as of right now, we're extrapolating down to 100 meters. And you can circle back to what Sean was, uh, maybe, maybe we can give him a mic or you could. Yeah, let me see if I can get Sean on. on I didn't think I, I just couldn't see an option to turn him on. Sean, uh, are you, are you on the line? You're muted. Maybe you walked away. <laughs> maybe so. Yep. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Um, well, sorry to circle all the way back to a question like a few questions ago, but um, I think there is some discussion about whether or not the landslide inventory, the deep-seated landslide inventory, could be used to potentially quantify or at least place maximum um, limits on ground shaking. And one kind of avenue that we've been thinking about but haven't really been, you know, like going after too seriously um, is to look at regions where there are really no landslides and there are, you know, there's large swaths of the Oregon coast range where there's steep slopes and lots of relief, um, really close to the coast, high expected ground shaking and really no slides at all. So if we can get really good geological data um, about, you know, the underlying rocks, then we can maybe start to use physics-based modeling to kind of put constraints on the amount of ground shaking um, that we know we didn't exceed basically. D does that make sense or is that useful? Yeah. So the okay. scope is that, yeah, that, that it, it didn't fail. So therefore it may not, it must not have exceeded some number. Yeah, exactly. And that's really all I had to add to that. So we can go back to what we were talking about. <laughs> no, it's great. Thanks, Sean. We're trying to do tons of things with that data set. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is good. Um, I'm seeing a lull in the in the questions. So I thought maybe um, in our last sort of waning minutes here, we could just um, talk a little bit more with the two of you about sort of any um, challenges you faced um, or um, what advice that you might have for others who are trying to work across such a you know, big project, lots of disciplinary boundaries, lots of different um, methods and techniques being employed. So maybe, um, do you guys want to say anything about some challenges that you face and how you overcame them in this um, arguably very successful collaboration? Um, I guess, I mean, we've talked about this a little, a little bit um, previously, and I think the major thing that I think of is, at first there was a big language barrier in terms of just technical language. Um, like I was not formally trained as an engineer, so just learning, some of their terminology um, took a long time. And the way that we overcame that, and I think one of the reasons why the M9 project was so successful is um, people put a lot of time into meetings and staying in touch and um, having small group regular uh, contact. And I think that's sometimes hard for people to hear because it's a huge commitment, the amount of time um, that all these meetings took. But I think that really is what contributed to making this project so successful. Um, so every other week we had full all hands meetings with the entire M9 project. Alex and I would frequently meet um, with a smaller group of seismologists and engineers every few weeks for a couple hours. And so all those meetings together kind of I think really propelled this collaboration forward. Yeah, I totally agree with Aaron. And it was a lot of the kind of work that continues to happen between Aaron and I came out of those geotechnical structural engineer meetings with the seismologist because I continue to not be a seismologist. Um, but it's it took understanding what Aaron and I were doing, what went into those models, and then trying to explain what we wanted from the synthetics and find those gaps where, oh, the generic velocity model doesn't fit the observed data, so can we do a better job? Mm -hmm. All of that just came out of sitting in a tiny windowless room for a couple hours every week. 
Yeah, and even, I mean, Alex touched on this a little bit in um, his presentation, but so one thing that Alex and I are working on now is making shape maps that will be put on the USGS website and that can be used for, um, for, for planning, hazard mitigation planning um, in the Pacific Northwest. And we, we have to make those adjustments for the, the local soil conditions and making those shape maps. And then kind of, as Alex said, I mean, knowing, just knowing who in our group has the expertise to help work on these problems um, because we had been having those meetings all along. I think it's made this shake map project go a little bit smoother. I, I think there were parallels in other parts of M9 that we were, or I was less involved in. Like I think mm -hmm. the uh, public policy and tsunami groups were closer than the engineers were to other groups. So yeah, that's, finding yeah. those connections across disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other things too is that we, um, when the project first initiated, we, we started with that kind of close contact from the beginning. So um, rather than finding out later that, you know, people in silos were working on different things and needed to talk, sort of the talking and the descriptions of what, what problems we were trying to tackle started really early on in this project. And so I think that that those seeds were planted very early and you know made a world of difference when we started to come uh, with results, right? So it wasn't like we were just starting to introduce ourselves to each other when we finally had data to share. Um, we were actually designing projects and experiments from the beginning with these kinds of collaborations in mind, which is very different from other projects that I've worked on, even ones where we intended to work across disciplinary boundaries, but we kind of sort of there was a science question first and then it was sort of like, oh, who should we gather to work on that versus a lot of the questions sort of came from our gathering. So mm -hmm. um, I think that was really important. A lot of, a lot of contact time early and often <laughs> was the key um, to the success of the project. Um, I'll just want to make sure that there's no other um, questions or thoughts from the audience um, in terms of um, any of the, the threads of discussion that we've got um, happening because I know we're running out of time here and I just wanna make sure I'm not ignoring anything or anybody. Um, all right, well, with this last minute, then maybe, I don't know, I'm gonna put you guys on the spot. Do you have, do you each have one piece of advice? Maybe you've already given yeah. it, but for somebody embarking on a project like this, There's a lull. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, maybe honestly, what you said, Allison, um, kind of getting, getting, or making these connections with people almost before you have the science question at hand. I know that's kind of the reverse of what people often do, and it's hard to, um, maybe it's hard to do it that way. But then, I think you're only going to get the time commitment from all these various groups if they're interested in the science questions. And it's easier to have everyone interested in the science questions if they're in the room together forma formulating those science questions. If it's not just one person in their office that makes it up and then go finds other people that he, that he or she hopes are interested in those questions. Um, so I guess putting yourself out there in other communities, um, even maybe before you have a project in mind is actually something that could be really helpful and is the reverse of what we often do. Yeah, I think directly from that, the most interesting kind of M9 derivatives I'm working on are happening now. Um, they're kind of because I've spent a couple years um, working with Aaron and working with Sean and yourself. Um, and so you just have to kind of s stick around. <laughs> yes. You're where the new exciting projects are. Yeah, that's great. Great advice. Okay, well, and I see the hour is now one. So that's perfect timing to say thank you again to our um, two panelists. Um, and thank you to Gabe for uh, designing this and um, inviting us to do this. And thank you to the audience. Uh, we really appreciate your attention. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Allison. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.